You are listening to Golden Globes Around the World. This is Michelle Manalis from the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Today we're speaking with three-time Golden Globe winning actor Richard Chamberlain. Long before George Clooney or Patrick Dempsey established careers playing iconic doctors, Richard Chamberlain starred in the hit medical drama Dr Kildare and quickly became the leading heart prob in the early 60s. He followed up in numerous films and TV shows, including the celebrated miniseries Showgun in 1980 when he was hailed King of the Miniseries. In 1983, he followed up with The Thorn Birds, and he was the first to play Jason Bourne in the 1988 made-for-TV movie, The Bourne Identity. A prolific actor, he also starred in theatre productions and earned rave reviews for his performances in Hamlet, Cyrano de Bergerac and My Fair Lady. Richard has written two books, an autobiography titled Shattered Love, a memoir, as well as My Life in Haiku. Hi, Richard. Thanks for joining us. We're very excited to talk to you. I'm excited too. So you've had an incredible career. You've won three Golden Globes, which we'll get to later, but you've performed in almost 50 films as well as 23 TV series. But first, I'd like to take you back to the first break in your career playing Dr. Kildare in the early 60s. Yes. What do you remember most from that time? Well... I couldn't believe my good fortune. I had only been, I, I'd been out of the army for maybe a year and a half. And I had been in acting class and doing all that stuff and singing lessons and all those things. And I had an occasional uh, TV job that helped pay the rent. I was in an apartment that was $60 a month, $2 a day and uh, loving it. And uh, suddenly um, the Kildare thing came up and uh, it was, total serendipity. It was an amazing stroke of good luck. Uh, a whole lot of moments of good luck led up to my getting the part. But it was suddenly, in almost no time at all, I mean, how lucky can you be? All my dreams came true. All I wanted in life was to be a working actor. And suddenly I was a working actor. It was just great. And Ray Massey was adorable. He was so wonderful to me. And uh, such a totally experienced and fabulous man, fabulous career. And I was very green. And I used to, uh, in, the, in the beginning, I would need several takes to get something right. He never flinched, never flinched at all. He was just wonderful to me. So it was a great, a great beginning of a career. Well, you weren't just a working actor, but you became a heartthrob as well during the set success of the show and there was an, even a Dr Kildare doll that I had myself. Yes there were. How did you deal with that kind of fame because that seemed like it was pretty much an overnight thing. It was overnight. In fact it was so overnight that it was very difficult to believe and uh, we were working extremely hard. Uh, TV series work is very difficult and I was in almost everything. And we did, I think, 36 shows the first year and 34 the second year. So I hardly had time to uh, eat and sleep. It was a, a grueling schedule, but wonderful. I loved it. Um, but the fame thing was wonderful and kind of unbelievable and super, but I didn't have much chance to experience it. I mean, I didn't get to wander around and have crowds cheering and things like that. That didn't happen. But it was, I, uh, I just couldn't believe my good fortune. I imagine, though, you would have had some fan, some fan letters back in those days. And also, I mean, they were a lot less sophisticated than they are now. Did they actually, did they think you were a real doctor? Well, they did. And I, and I got asked a lot, uh, either through mail or in person you know, for medical advice. But I was getting 12,000 letters a week. That's more than Clark Gable ever got. I mean, it was amazing. And the studio handled it all in great expense. Um, but it was, and I get all, lots of presents. And the Japanese, I was big in Japan. Uh, the Japanese girls would make those uh, wonderful or origami, is it? The, the folded uh, paper, little paper storks. And they would send me, hundreds and hundreds of them sort of hanging in a, a kind of chandelier. It was uh, an, an amazing. And we gave a lot of the presents that I got to uh, 
to children, children's hospitals and things like that. What prompted you to pursue a career in acting? You said you were taking classes. Was it a certain performance you saw when you were a kid and realised this is what I want to do, or how did it come about? Well, when I was a little kid, I was, I was quite shy, and I hated school. I was not a good student, and uh, the best part of my life was getting a couple of friends together and going to the movies, which was about a half an hour walk away. And I think it was only a dime when I was first started going to the movies for a double bill. And I thought that's where I felt alive. I thought I looked up at that silver screen and I thought, I don't want to go to school. I don't want all this other stuff. I want to be up there. I want to live there. And, and that's when I decided that being an actor would be the best possible thing I could imagine doing. But on the other hand, I was, I was very shy and uh, had that to work against. Was it easy to get your career going in terms of getting an agent and a manager? Well, I, there again, I sort of lucked out. My father was in AA and uh, he had been a drunk and was now sober in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he knew uh, some people in that. He, he knew um, the fellow who did uh, Queen for a Day. Um, I can't. His name suddenly slips my mind. Anyway, my father arranged a lunch with uh, Jack Jack Bailey, I think his name was, and he was very big on te in television then, and and to meet his agent, and we went to the Brown Derby and had lunch, and the agent was of course completely bored, not interested at all, but he did arrange for me to do an audition at MCA, his agency, which is the biggest agency in the world, and we I I got together with a girl in acting class. And we did a scene from, I think it was Green Mansions or something. She was a, a, a jungle sprite and I was chasing her around the jungle and that was the scene. And so we, we, we did the scene in the basement of uh, MCA, which was, even the basement was kind of glorious, full of antiques and things. Um, but, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the agents we did, it for said well that was nice but you seemed a bit nervous what, could you do it again so we did it a second time Monique James was the, the main agent she was the big time agent and lo and behold they decided to sign me MCA decided to sign me this total nobody and um, and that was that that's how I got my first agent uh, and then um, things started to happen my very first job was on Gunsmoke. I had a morning's work on Gunsmoke. And it was thrilling. And I didn't know anything about, about uh, filming technique, about hitting marks and all that sort of thing. But I learned really fast and, uh, and got through that. It was just one day's work, but I, I got to work with James Arness and stuff. And it was amazing. But, but anyway, that led to some other things and finally to Kildare. So after... Kildare ended in 1966. You relocated to England for a while where you made your mark as a serious actor in the theatre. So that must have been a huge risk for you given you had already had your success on TV and then you, you left for a little while. So what prompted that move? Well, Ray Massey invited me to lunch once in a while when he had big time people over, you know, big time English theatre people and stuff. So I could just sit and listen to them all talk and Cedric Sir Cedric Hardwick was there sitting on, across the table from me at one time and he said he was in a very nice way he said you know Richard it's a shame that you are a star before you've learned to act and he didn't he wasn't mean it wasn't mean it was that he was from a, a, a British stage tradition where you went to drama school and you did this and worked in, in uh, monthly yearly anyway and, and you, you had lots and lots and lots of training. So that's when I decided, you know something? I should go to England. I think I should go to England and go to drama school and get my basic, basic training and really learn how to do it. And so I did. I flew to England and um, I had a little English family there that I stayed with for a while. But anyway, uh, instead of going to drama school, I started working right away. Almost the minute I got off the plane, my in British agent said, uh, would you like to do some BBC TV? And I said, sure. And uh, they had a, a, a miniseries coming up of uh, Henry James' Portrait of a Lady, the, this wonderful, wonderful novel. 
And uh, so anyway, I, I met the, the director and he liked me and I got the part of uh, Ralph Touchett in that marvelous series and started working in England, um, which again was incredible good luck. And so instead of going to drama school, it was, it was like on the job training, uh, working with wonderful directors and wonderful actors and learning that way. And you also starred in revivals of My Fair Lady, The Sound of Music and Cyrano de Bergerac. And I'm just wondering, what were the unexpected joys and challenges of moving into theatre and learning new skills? Ah, well, the theatre work was, as always, very hard work and thrilling to me. I mean, to be on stage in front of an audience, whoa, what a, what a joy that is, uh, assuming that they like you. <laughs> um, um, but I, I took to the stage with, I had done some stage work in college and all that. Um, so it wasn't brand new to me. Um, but the, the, the discipline of it and the camaraderie of it, the teamwork of it uh, was right down my alley. It, was, it made me very happy. Um, and I, I loved doing it. I did several plays at the Amundsen Theater in Los Angeles. Uh, Cyrano and, and uh, Night of the Iguana and some things like that. Um, and it was, it was thrilling. It's thrilling to be on stage night after night, eight a week. Um, so it's hard work, but it's just thrilling, especially, as I said, if they like you. Not, not so much fun if they don't. No, <laughs> getting booed on the stage is not fun. I can't. Oh, that did happen to me once, actually. We did a musical version of Breakfast at Tiffany's in New York with an all star company, Mary Tyler Moore, all star cast, all star everybody. Abe Burroughs was directing. Uh, but the audience hated us. They just, when the, we got into previews, they just, well, it's a long story. Uh, it was, it was, it was fun for me, but it was not getting good reviews when we were on the road, you know, with the tryouts. And then they brought in, uh, they brought in uh, Edward Albee to rewrite it. And he, he was a fairly dark character, you know, and so he, he rewrote this musical in a, in a rather dark way. And we, we closed in Boston and we went to New York and uh, um, had rehearsals for a couple of weeks of this new show and then opened the previews. And that's when the audience had never seen a dark musical before. They had never seen anything like that. And they hated it. They absolutely hated us. And they booed and walked out and it was really staggering. Um, I know I had, a, I had a couple of songs in it and I had, I had a line, uh, I'll never sing again. And somebody in the audience said, good. <laughs> 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 and Mary used to go off stage. She had never experienced anything like that before. And she would go off stage and cry and then come back. And, uh, and we do our scenes and things. But um, it closed after four previews. We had an enormous uh, 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 pre-sale, millions of dollars of pre-sale. But uh, David Merrick, uh, who produced it, closed the show and uh, gave everybody their money back. And it was... Uh, it was my first experience of, uh, of colossal failure. And I've met people in New York, um, like Angela Lansbury, people like that, who said, you know, Richard, it's good that you experience this now because failure is part of the business. Get used to it. It'll happen again and soldier on. And they were really nice about it. Did you deal with it well? Or did you take it very personally? Did you question well, the Mary acting? Mary gave an a, 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 a end-of-show party at Sardi's upstairs, and everybody got very drunk, including me. And uh, I said to Larry Kurt, who was in the show at that time, I said, Larry, can you sort of guide me back to the theater? I, I want to see my name on a marquee one more time. <laughs> <laughs> we got there, and I just wept and wept and wept and wept and went home and cried some more. Yeah, it was sort of heartbreaking because I was actually having a good time in the show uh, and I missed everybody and, and the show when I was over. In the 70s, you took on many film roles, including Lady Caroline Lamb, where you worked with Sir Laurence Olivier. And I just wondered what were your standout memories of that time and were you intimidated to be working with him? Um, 
it was a very interesting movie. Robert Bolt wrote it and directed it. Brilliant, brilliant man. Um, and Sarah Miles played the lady. Uh, and uh, Sir Lawrence just had a couple of scenes, which he was fabulous in. Uh, and I was in one of the scenes, but we never had anything to say to each other. I know when, when I met him backstage, you know, and I was flabbergasted to meet him, um, uh, he said, oh, Richard, he said, I've admired your work so much, which is something that great English actors say, whether they mean it or not. And <laughs> but I was bowled over that he even knew who I was. Uh, but we didn't actually have a scene together, except that I was in the background of one of his scenes. But watching him work on stage was fabulous. You went on to play in movies, including The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, and one of my favourite movies from that time was The Towering Inferno. Uh -huh. uh, that was a different kind of role for you. I mean, you were playing a pretty unlikable villain. Was that part of the attraction? Yes, it was part of the attraction. Um, I thought, whoa, it's time to play a bad guy. And I, I think maybe I overdid it. I, I played him so bad <laughs> <laughs> that he was really hateful. Uh, but that's what was in the script. You know, he, he was responsible for burning down this glorious building. Um, but I got to work with uh, all sorts of fabulous people. And and it, it, a lot of the, of the movie took place in the ballroom at the top of the, of the famous building. And, uh, so, and so people hung out there. People like Fred Astaire and Bill Holden and... Well, and Steve McQueen and, and uh, uh, Paul Newman and Faye Dunaway, we, everybody just sort of was hanging around a lot. So I got to listen in on a lot of uh, conversations and things. So it was, it, that part of it was quite thrilling. And, pl and playing the bad guy was kind of fun too. But uh, my agent at the time, after seeing the film said, you shouldn't have played him quite so bad, he said. From memory, I think he was pushing women out of the way to. Escape the fire. Escape himself, yeah, elbowing old <laughs> ladies out of the way. Something for the, for the rope. For, to, but he did fall to his death. So that's the good news. You've worked with some incredible directors, including Peter Weir for The Last Wave, and I wondered what it was like working with him. Peter, I didn't know much about at that time. It was a long, long, long time ago. He had made one film that I had not seen called Picnic at Hanging Rock. And so my agent called and said, Peter Weir would be interested in you for a new film of his called The Last Wave. And I said, well, can I see the Cape Picnic at Hanging Rock? I was living in New York at the time. So he set up a screening and I thought it was one of the best films I'd ever seen. It was an extraordinarily good film, um, wonderful film. And so I said, yes, yes, I, I would kill to work with this man. And then when I met Peter, he was very young and he looked deceptively like a kind of English choir boy. He was uh, light skinned and uh, rosy cheeked and young and charming. And I thought, whoa, this is... but on set and during the show, he was, his, his extraordinary depth became obvious. Um, and I think, I think it's one of my, the, my favorite things I've ever done. I think it's some of the best acting I've ever done. And it was largely because he was so, he was so precise and smart about the way he directed me. It was great working with him and the crew because uh, it was the beginning of, of the kind of uh, Australian renaissance of filmmaking. And the crew was young and they hadn't done that many films before and they were so gung-ho and excited about doing it that it was a fabulous, fabulous experience. And working with the Aborigines and David Gopal and all was amazing because they were the real deal. They were the real thing. Uh, Nanjuara, who was the, one of the stars of it, was a, a genuine tribal elder and fabulous to meet. Um, so working with, with uh, Peter was, and we stayed friends for quite a long time after that, uh, was, was great. Moving into the 80s, which was a very successful decade for you, and it seemed that you were working nonstop. You were hailed as the king of the miniseries <clears throat> for your work in Centennial, Shogun and the Thornbirds. But I read that you weren't too crazy about that title. Why is that? Because everything you did was so successful. You didn't like being called king of the miniseries. 
Well, in all truth, <laughs> <laughs> to tell you to, to drop the mask and to, no, it was very, uh, um, it was very complimentary. I, I thought secretly, I thought, oh, that's great. What a good thing to be king of the miniseries because miniseries was a wonderful medium to work in. Uh, they got the best material, the best novels and things to dramatize. They had lots of time and lots of money to spend on the productions. Um, so it was, it, I thought it was a perfect medium because serious television is so fast that you really got to be on your toes all every minute. And movie making is so slow that you can get quite bored waiting around for the next take. Um, but miniseries was just right. And, uh, and, and as I said, the material was so, I mean, Shogun, what a great book. And, uh, and the Thornbirds, wonderful stuff. And Wallenberg, it's just great, great material. So it's a thrilling medium to work in. Shogun was the only American production to ever shoot in Japan at that time. What was that experience like? And did you get much time to travel around the country? Yes, we did get time to travel uh, because we had weekends off, which is very unusual when you're on location. Usually you just get the one day um, because of money problems and all. But they, I think they knew that we all needed the weekends off. And so they gave us the weekends off. And so I had this lovely, lovely, young, beautiful Japanese interpreter girl who I went around. Uh, for instance, we were 10 weeks in Kyoto, 10 weeks in that gorgeous city and we used to go on on the weekends all up Mount Hiei which is where all the temples and things were and uh, run into extraordinary extraordinary experiences yes I saw a lot of Japan and 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 we were in a, a, a fishing village for several weeks uh, where they were not they were unused to uh, uh, gaijin uh, uh, you know non-japanese people and the kids used to follow us around and and gaze at us and wonder what we were all about um but and the japanese were so friendly and terrific and the japanese actors i thought were absolutely terrific there was a great deal of conflict between the american crew and the japanese crew um the american crew had not been schooled in Japanese etiquette and had said uh, things that the, in the beginning, haven't you fuckers ever made a movie before? And only that's, you just say that once in a Japanese setting and you're finished. I mean, you, you know, it's war um, because they never behaved that way. And there was a lot of conflict, uh, uh, which I stayed clear of, um, because I got, I got on fine with, with everybody on the set and stuff and then the wonderful actors. But there, there was that one problem that uh, there was a, a lot of tension. You went on to star on the Thornbirds playing Father Ralph. What did you make of this iconic character and how did you prepare to play a priest? Um, we had a, a wonderful uh, advisor, a young Jesuit named Terry Sweeney, advise us. And he worked it out so that I could go, for instance, to a novitiate, a, a novitiate downtown where uh, young men were learning how to be uh, Jesuit priests. And I got to stay overnight there and I got to go to their prayers and their discussions and their classes for several days, which was kind of unheard of. Um, and some of them, I thought, were not exactly welcoming to this stranger coming in but then i was i was in a in a kind of prayer meeting with them in the maybe the second morning and the uh the uh priest who was leading it said something like um when there's a stranger in our midst it means the presence of christ is there and that touched me so deeply, I started to cry. I really, I really started to weep. I was so touched by the sincerity of what he said that the other guys, the other novitiates said, oh, well, maybe he's okay. <laughs> and we got along after that. But uh, Terry was extremely helpful in uh, preparing me for the, the religious scenes and all. Women around the world fell in love with Father Ralph. And I think in part because you had such great chemistry with Rachel Ward. Um, 
how did you establish that kind of chemistry with Rachel? Did you spend a lot of time with her? How, how did you achieve that? We did spend quite a lot of time together. We, we, when you're doing a show like that, there's not a lot of free time to, for instance, go have drinks and stuff, which we did not do, uh, that I recall. But a lot of time on the set. And I felt so for her I've, because the very first scene, producers are odd ducks. They often uh, uh, schedule scenes in ways that are not helpful to the actor. For instance, you might have to do a scene at your wife's funeral before you even meet the actress who plays your wife. It can be scheduled that way. And they had scheduled an extremely difficult scene for her as her very, very first scene. And, and she had some trouble with it that particular day uh, because it was, well, it was so unfair, the scheduling anyway. Um, and I, I sort of fell in love with her during that because I, I, I so empathized with her, with the difficulty of that particular day's work. And, uh, and that kind of, and I was as helpful as I could be. And uh, um, that kind of established that, that she trusted me after that, if you know what I mean. Um, and we got on wonderfully, wonderfully well. I loved working with her and she was, absolutely totally professional even though she hadn't hadn't really done that much acting before as far as as far as i know considering she hadn't done that much acting how difficult or maybe not so difficult were the love scenes the love scenes oh fabulous love scenes are always fun <laughs> unless you have to worry about where the 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 actress's microphone is hiding and things like that but um uh, oh no, the love scene. She's so beautiful and she was so eager. And also she was falling in love at the time with Brian Brown, who played her husband in the thing. And Brian and I had a, did not have a good relationship. We didn't have a bad relationship, but in the movie, of course, we, we were at war with each other in the movie. So we didn't spend any time together on the set uh, because sort of pr to preserve that antipathy. Um, so I didn't get to know Brian hardly at all during the shoot, but she did, and she was falling in love with him. And so she would began to bloom into this loving creature. And I, of course, thought, oh, it must be me. <laughs> <laughs> Which made the love scenes even more fun to do. Um, but, uh, but no, it was Brian. Brian won her in the end. And then I met them 25 years later. I had not, not had any contact with him for 25 years or... or uh, Rachel, um, and we met in Hollywood at some kind of uh, a publicity thing. And Brian was there and he turned out to be the sweetest, funniest, nicest guy, which I didn't even know before. He's just a dreamy guy, a wonderful fellow. So I was happy to, uh, to get to know him at last. You went on to do some action roles. You did King Solomon's Mines and then you were the first to play Jason Bourne in The Bourne Identity. Was that a conscious decision to do more physical roles or was that just what was on offer at the time? No, that, those are the things that were offered. And uh, uh, King Solomon's Mines was a hoot. It was a kind of sort of a, uh, 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 it wasn't totally serious. And so it, that was fun to do. And we were working in, uh, in Africa for a long time and I really fell in love with Africa. It's just it gets under your skin. It's wonderful and beautiful. And the, the people we worked with were great. But anyway, um, um, so we did that. And then we did the sequel. So we were in Zimbabwe for uh, over a half year, maybe close to two, close to a whole year, making these rather silly films. Um, and The Born Identity, I had read the book and was fascinated by it. And we worked like demons to uh, to make it work for film because it's extremely complicated uh, story. And so we had endless, endless meetings, uh, script meetings to try to make it work and uh, it succeeded, I think. Um, but I, th I thought he was a, a really fascinating character and a fascinating story. But I thought it was better than the first Matt Damon one, which was only an hour and a half and didn't have time to include all the intricacies of the story. It wasn't his fault. 
it was the the time spot because we had four hours to tell the story. Um, but then I thought his, his subsequent ones were really, really good. And he was wonderful in it. Did they let you do many stunts? Yes. Yes. The fight scenes in the sun, yeah, and the running around, yeah, quite a bit. But I had done a lot of stunts, you know, in the Three Musketeers and all those movies. I had done a lot of, of stunt stuff. Not uh, not uh, Tom Cruise kind of stuff, but uh, <laughs> but a, a fair amount of stunt work, yeah. And the fight scenes are always very well rehearsed and uh, choreographed, but they're still dangerous, especially with swords and all that. Any injuries? No, knock on wood, knock on wood. Wallenberg was another heroic role for you, and I read that you said it was some of the best acting you've ever done. So I just wondered, what was it about that character or that movie that inspired you so much? Well, he was a great, great man. He, my golly, he went to see, um, he went to see a Leslie Howard film, The Scarlet Pimpernel, with his sister long before uh, his involvement in the war. And when they came out, he said to her, God, I would love to be able to do something like that because in the in the Scarlet Pimpernel, he saved lots and lots of people. Uh, it's sort of behind a mask, and uh, he said that that he would love to do that, and ended up doing it in real life uh, when the Nazis were uh, killing the Jews, and he saved oh thousands of Jews um, uh, through sheer chutzpah and sort of play acting, and. Uh, Foxing, out foxing the, the Germans. Um, and I thought, whoa, what a great man. But he was a fascinating, fascinating character. And he, he, we had a wonderful love story in it with Alice Krieger, who was great in the show. Um, but it was, it was thrilling to do. And there were some rather high powered scenes in it. And the director had me do them over and over and over again until we got the right intensity uh, and and some of them came off quite well um, but I was honored actually to impersonate him just going back to the thorn birds for a minute because I was just thinking you've been in so many hugely successful films and tv series specifically in the thorn birds did you have a feeling while you were shooting that it would become the phenomenon that it became I wasn't surprised because it was it was such an audience-pleasing story, um, and it was so brilliantly cast. And I, gosh, just working with Barbara Stanwyck was incredible. Um, and and uh, and it had uh, tons of romance and tons of drama. And I wasn't that surprised. Also, it was a bit naughty. I mean, a priest uh, falling in love. Uh, was uh, dicey material, and the church wasn't delighted with us, I think. Um, but I had a feeling that might go over big, and especially in Italy and places like that, in Catholic countries. Uh, and it did. It was. It it really caught the uh, it caught the audience uh, wonderfully well. In the nineties, you appeared on the sitcoms, um, the Drew Carey Show, and Will. And Grace, as well as dramas like Desperate Housewives and Brothers and Sisters. TV has, of course, changed a lot over the decades. What did you enjoy about working on those shows? And what were the main differences since you started, you know, say on Dr. Kildare? Well, it's a, it's a totally different medium working in a sitcom uh, because you have an audience. And between scenes, the, the producers all come out after each scene uh, and they huddle and they figure out ways to improve the scene and get more laughs. And then they change your lines a little bit to here and there. This was uh, Will and Grace. I love doing Will and Grace. Um, and uh, then they'd go off and you'd do the scene again with the new lines and things and get more laughs. And then they'd come back and huddle. And it was a process that I had never experienced before. And I loved it. And uh, Deborah Messing uh, said to me, we were sitting waiting for a new take. And she said, you know, you're, you're doing this really well. She said a lot of actors can't handle this, um, uh, line changes and all that stuff. And I thought that was very sweet of her, but they were extremely nice to me and it was great fun doing that. 
But getting to your three Golden Globes, you won for Dr. Kildare, Shogun and the Thornbird. Do you remember what those awards meant to you at the time? And what do you remember about the night itself on those three occasions? Well, the Hollywood Foreign Press parties, award parties, were famous for being the most fun of all. The people drank a little more. Uh, there was more fun. There was they were looser. They were they and the the foreign press was ever so nice. They were really really nice to me my whole my whole career. You folks just wonderfully nice, but the the events were 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 famously fun, and uh, and then actually winning was uh, uh, a new experience for me too. Um, I had been nominated for. Emmys, for instance, a few times, but never, never won. So I loved winning the Golden Globes. That was that was great, and to hold that Golden Globe in your hands and to be able to thank everybody and uh, uh, it's just a delightful feeling. I was I'm very proud of them. They're in my living room now, glittering on a shelf uh, for all to see. Do you remember who you were sitting with, or maybe you were starstruck by someone? Golly, I don't. Um, I was sitting with the producers and a, and a director. Um, I know for for uh, the Thornbirds, for instance, the producers had been rather angry with the director, who was terrific, but he he did some reshoots, partly at my request, that they didn't approve of, and so they were kind of angry with him, and they didn't uh, they didn't thank him enough. Um, in their speeches, and so I was able to thank him uh, in my speech, which was great. Um, but I don't recall, I don't recall the actual events that it was a long time ago. Um, I wish I could say that, uh, yes, I had sat with uh, Mae West and... <laughs> Do you remember if, if those wins impacted your career at all? Um, I think they help, of course they help. Uh, sure, sure. In in exactly what way I don't know because I don't know what's in the minds of the people who continue to hire me. But um, oh, I think they they make a big difference. Absolutely, they also influence the Academy Awards. I think definitely. Um, you're one of the few successful actors regarded seriously by your peers, while you maintained a sex symbol image for the public. Did that image sit well with you, or were you uncomfortable with it? Um, I was comfortable in it because it it meant work. It meant that I would I would continue to work, which was great. And and it's uh, and to be a a kind of sex symbol uh, is very flattering. I mean, it's extremely flattering. And um, ego. I've always had a a part of me that says. Oh, Richard, you're really not good enough. And so it, it helped ward off that sort of background noise in my head. Of all the characters you've played, I guess, who have you missed the most? Of the characters I've played, mm -hmm. um, probably Cyrano de Bergerac and, uh, and Thomas Mendip in The Ladies Not for Burning, which is a, a play I did for PBS and also in New York. And Kildare too. I mean, I loved being him. It was great. Uh, Father Ralph was, it'd be hard to choose. I, Father Ralph was fascinating because he was so, in a sense, tortured. It was, the, 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 the inner drama was extraordinary because he was, he, was, he was torn not two ways, but three ways. He loved God, genuinely. He loved Maggie with all his heart. And he also loved the drama the power, the uh, the the, uh, the the glamour of the church, and he succeeded in sort of in all three for a while, but they were it was uh, very difficult for him to deal with all this. There was so much working against him. You wrote an autobiography in 2013, Shattered Love. What prompted you to write about your life, and was the experience a cathartic one? Yes. Um, I was tempted by a very good, very hot uh, New York uh, publisher. Uh, she was also a very attractive woman um, to write a book. 
And I didn't want to write a book particularly. And she kept suggesting that I write this book. And so I started to think seriously about it. And at the time I was doing a lot of uh, sort of spiritual work and personal work, uh, psychological work, things like that. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll write a book about, about love and about uh, the power of love in our lives and things like that. It would be a, kind of a philosophical book. And so I started writing and uh, then was temp I, I didn't want to write about being gay because uh, I knew that's all anybody would want to talk about. And so I wasn't going to talk about it in the book. And then I, both my producer and my partner at the time said, Richard, you've got to make this personal. You've got to talk about yourself. And so I started to make it personal and, and dared to write about being gay, which I had kept as secret as possible for decades. And, um, and suddenly during the course of, of doing this writing, I had an, an, an extraordinary experience. I was in this little room where I was writing and, uh, and in, ha in, in Hawaii, and it was almost as if an angel came in the room and put her hand on my head. I mean, this did not happen, of course, but it was felt like this and put her hand on my head and said, Richard, it's over. All this self-dislike, all this fear, all this hiding, it's over. The fact of being gay is completely benign. It's almost boring. It's just not even interesting. And so wake up. And it worked. It, it's, this, this experience got really into my heart and into my bones. And I suddenly was completely unafraid. And shortly after that, I was on Larry King and all these things, selling the book, you know, and uh, talking. All I wanted to talk about was being gay in Hollywood. And I was talking about it as if it were nothing. I mean, it was as if it were, yeah, just part of life. And no fear at all. So it was a kind of miracle. So writing the book, yes to answer your question, was extremely therapeutic for me. Because in contrast to your experience, I remember Rupert Everett famously said it was career suicide for him when he came out. Yes. I wonder why people were more accepting of you. Well, for one thing, I was 86. I mean, sorry, sorry, 68. Right. I was 68 at the time. So my, my days of being a sex symbol were like not very, we're sort of over. Um, um, and it, it didn't affect, no, it didn't affect my work at all in, in the theater and musicals and all that. No, it was okay. And then you also published the book, My Life in Haiku. What inspired this kind of book of poetry and illustrations? Well, I've, 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 I've been a painter. I was an art major in college, for instance, and I've been painting a lot all my life. And, um, and I've always been interested in Japan and Japanese art and things, but very interested in haiku. And over my, even in my young life, I would occasionally write one or two of them. And, um, and so I came into a period, oh, this is, I don't know, I don't know, 10 years ago, whenever it was, I, that I, I was writing lots of them and fascinated by the whole process. It's, it's you know it's a, it's a, it's a it's a form of poetry that's 17 syllables five syllables seven syllables five syllables so it's it's difficult to find a way to express an interesting thought in 17 syllables and it was a kind of game for me but anyway i i started writing them and i thought whoa maybe i'll do a little book so i did this self published book and included some of my paintings in it that were seemed apropos and it was fun to do. And so I passed them out among my friends and they sold a few and it was, it was great, but it's, a, it's, I still write them. Um, and in fact, I just wrote a whole bunch and passed them out to my friends beyond the book itself. Can you tell me a bit about your life now in Hawaii where you've lived for many years? What, what's sort of a typical day for you? Well, I am now 87 years old old um, and I have slowed down a bit. Um, I love to swim in the ocean where we live on the ocean, thank goodness. And I swim in the ocean and 
I socialize with friends and I watch a lot of TV. I'm up on the news. <laughs> I, um, um, I travel a little bit, um, but mostly here, my days are really quite simple. And we have some wonderful friends here and um, often have dinner together or go on little outings and things. It's a very simple life to answer your question here in Hawaii. Very simple. A lot of sitting around watching TV, which I love to do. A lot of reading. Um, and so it's, it's a kind of ideal retirement in a very beautiful place. What, what are you enjoying on TV right now? Uh, Rachel Maddow. Mm -hmm. um, um, we were watching something called Yellowstone uh, the other night. And it was wonderfully well done. And Costner is terrific in it. It's a little tough for me. Um, um, it's very a very butch show, <laughs> but, <laughs> but very good. Um, the Crown I loved. Um, uh, you know, the, the usual fare. You've achieved so much in your life, professionally and personally. Is there anything on your bucket list? My bucket list. I would love to see New Zealand um, for some reason. Um, I would love to go back to Paris if things ever cool down COVID wise and all, because I have dear friends there. Um, Italy always, always seems like heaven to me. Um, but I'm, I'm not terribly keen to long distance fly anymore. Um, um, no, I think, I think what a bucket list. Um, no, I haven't got a long bu bu bucket, a bucket list at the moment. I, I seem to be in, in the best place in the world to me in here in Hawaii. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure learning about your life. Thank you. It's been lovely t speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Golden Globes Around the World is a production of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Executive produced by Jenny Cooney, produced by Mirai Konishi and Matt Smith. If you enjoyed this episode, help us spread the word by rating and reviewing the podcast or sharing a link. To catch all the latest from the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, you can follow us on Twitter at Golden Globes and on Instagram at Golden Globes or visit our website, goldenglobes.com. Thanks again and we'll see you next time.